waiting for for a long time, Shannon. So um, LeBron Ooh. James has been vaccinated. He has confirmed. Oh, I was losing sleep over that, Bob. Well, I know you were. <laughs> uh, you know, hey, well, listen, the, the, one of the issues for LeBron is that he plays in the state of California and they've maintained that if you are, if you're not vaccinated, you, even as a player, you can't play, you well, wouldn't be able to play at Staples Center. So well, yeah, well, and let's be honest. I mean, that's why he got vaccinated, you know? Sure. I, I don't understand why you wouldn't get vaccinated, but that's why he did. And um, it ain't no big deal. It's just that every time a high profile, a high profile athlete gets a lot more attention if he's not vaccinated than if he is. Yeah, but that's right. Um, that's the news. Well, it, well, and, and let's face it with what we have seen, gosh, now for 14 or 15 months with the role in particularly the United States um, in the Black Lives Matters system um, and uh, the George Floyd issue, uh, LeBron James carries a lot of weight Le and, and what, what LeBron James says and LeBron James does hopefully helps people get through these situations. And I mean, to me, that it, for LeBron, I, I mean, I just made an assumption he was vaccinated. Um, and, and ho hopefully that will, that will allow and, and get enough people feeling more comfortable um, to be vaccinated. I mean, you know, here in Ontario, Bob, we're at 82% now. Yeah. 82%. Yeah. Well, the other 18% ought to be kicked out of the province. But having said that, I mean, I wonder whether, I, I understand your, your position, but I wonder whether LeBron James in this kind of scenario can in, influence anybody. I, I just find it inexplicable that, that, that yeah. people wouldn't get, a, get vaccinated. And if you're, if you've held out this long, almost two years, Mm -hmm. If you've held out this long, have you been waiting for LeBron James to say, I'm vaccinated, you should be? I don't know. I mean, they'll buy his sneakers. They'll, uh, they'll pay attention to some of the things he says. I just think in this one, people are really stuck in the mud. Well, it's, it's, I mean, I don't, I mean, I, I, the circles of people I travel in, this isn't even a debate, Bob. Of course it's not. It, it, it's, it's, I mean, I don't, I, I, there was a point, I think, that I said, uh, and that became, actually, I, I, I walk my dogs two or three times a day, and, and it became, uh, in the middle of the summer, it became part of the conversation is, have you, have you got your first shot yet? Have you got your second shot yet? That yeah. became part of, rather than saying hello. Oh, no, you're right. And 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 because it was just it was just a given that it would happen, uh, and and so in many ways, may, and maybe it's our age, Bob. Maybe we understand that more. Maybe we've been through it. Maybe we maybe we we we've thought it through better, um, in in thinking that you know you should be vaccinated not not just for yourself but for your family and for everybody around you and everybody you have contact with. Well, look, at, I'm not the kind of guy that runs to a doctor. I, that, I, I, I go if I absolutely have to. Otherwise, I, I avoid it. But this yeah. one just to me seemed, just seemed to be a complete no-brainer. That at the very least, if I'm confronted by this disease, I'm in better shape to handle it. Um, people are dying. And um, none of us want to be that guy. No, and and if you think you're immune, um, you're not, and and you're like some, like a teenager, who thinks that oh, I'll never get it, so I don't have to worry about it. Well, I had two friends; they're casual friends. Um, I did see them a couple times socially. I had no idea that they weren't vaccinated, but they weren't. They both got COVID. He spent a couple days in the hospital, and she spent a month. Wow. in the hospital and very nearly passed away. And um, as, as predicted, after they got it and went through what they went through, they got vaccinated. They changed, they changed their mind. They changed their mind. It's a hell of a, yeah. hell of a thing to have to go through in order to change your mind. Yeah. Yeah. And well, um, anyway, let's, let's hope that, uh, let's hope that uh, we can get uh, from 80% to 90% sooner than later or a hundred. Yeah. Well, I don't uh, think that's possible. I don't think, well, I don't think there's possible to get a hundred percent of anything anymore. So. Well, there are, there are sports teams that are a hundred percent vaccinated. The Toronto Raptors are, and, and maybe the Winnipeg Jets are, uh, we're going to find that out 
Kevin Sheveldayoff is the general manager of the Jets, and we'll talk about him and COVID and his hockey team and the fact that they're actually going to cross the border, play in front of fans, all kinds of new stuff. You mean, you mean real, real hockey in, in real arenas with real people? Uh, as far as I know, no more cardboard cutouts. Wonder what they did with all those cardboard cutouts. <laughs> Maybe that's a question we should ask. Uh, Kevin right. Shevel day off when we come back after these messages. McGowan and Shannon back with you and uh, the general manager of the Winnipeg Jets, Kevin Shevel day off joins us. And um, well, it's kind of hard to tell Kevin, but um, you don't really have that much of a tan. <laughs> uh, although the weather apparently is great in Winnipeg. I guess at this time of year, you don't get outside much, huh? No, it's, uh, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, in the rinks, which is a good thing to, uh, to, to be at. And, um, you know, it was exciting the other day. We had our first uh, home preseason game to essentially a full house. And uh, it was great to, to have the fans back in the rink. Uh, and, um, you know, hockey season just around the corner. Well, it, what was that? What was actually that thought of people in the seats and cheering for the Jets without any, uh, any fake music or stuff like that? What was that like? Well, I, you know, I think for the guys, it was, um, you know, it was a great moment because, um, you know, again, and the crowd was, uh, was good. Generally, you know, preseason games sometimes can be sparse uh, by their nature because, uh, you know, especially early on when you're, you're not dressing full teams, but, um, you know, it was a good atmosphere. It was a great building. Um, and, you know, I think there was a general excitement level by everybody, um, you know, to, uh, to, to be back in and, and, uh, and cheering. So yeah, speaking of that, um, we do know uh, from history and, and certainly the games that I've watched, the preseason games that I've watched so far this year, that teams don't dress their full roster. That's understandable. But you do sprinkle in a few veterans here and there, maybe yeah, as many to, as Bob. half. Yeah, yeah, you have to. Well, is there a temptation to do more or less of that, Kevin? Well, I think, you know, as, uh, you know, as it goes on, you, you, you speak to your veteran players and say, how are you feeling? Do you need, you know, what do you need to, to get out of this? Do you need another game? Don't you need another game? I think generally speaking teams, you know, tend to, um, when you get towards the latter part of the, the, uh, uh the preseason, um, you know, start playing more veterans, you know, we, we have, we have about 40, I think 43 or 44 players in camp here right now. And, and, um, you know, a couple of the junior players will start, you know, trickling back to junior hockey, you know, shortly. And then uh, when the American league camp opens up, we'll pare down those numbers as well to, for, for, for some of the younger guys that are maybe going. And then, you know, it, it kind of ramps up to the end where the last, you know, two or three games, you might have your, you know, essentially your full team or, or maybe two or three guys that are battling for that position that, you know, is still kind of up in the air. So, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting because we didn't have any preseason last year at all. And some people say, well, you know, maybe you don't need any, but, um, I, I do think it's still an essential part of evaluation for for some of the younger players and, and seeing where they're at and and uh, in evaluating your roster. Well, speaking of that evaluation process, um, some of it is yours, some of it is your coach Paul Maurice's. But how much impact do you put on a, a player's performance during a game, as opposed to what you see in countless practices, workouts, skates, etc.? Well, you know, again, uh, you can do drills and you can do skill practices, um, but when you're competing against, um, uh, you know, a, another team and another player and, and um, you know, you have to, you know, the results are being tabulated and counted, you know, like uh, wins and losses may not really mean much in the, in the, um, in the preseason, but, you know, there's still a score in a game and there's still, you know, breakdowns that happen and, and there has to be teaching moments, um, you know, for whether it's younger players or veteran players and, and, um, so again, I, I, we're, I'm not a big proponent of having too many of them, but I, I do think that, um, you know, again, the evaluation process, certainly for, you know, young defensemen trying to, you know, cut their teeth and, um, you know, being able to go out there and, and, and gain some confidence and, and, uh, um, be able to make a mistake and still survive it and, and get a chance to, to, for maybe to play again the next game. I think it's important. So you, you talked about battles. How many battles do you think are on your roster? Well, I think we've got some, uh, you know, on the on the bottom six side of things on the forward group, uh, and um, you know, I, you know, we'll probably have a, a a battle for the number seven spot on defense uh, if you if you look at how things are, are constructed right now. But 
you're, you're not just battling for your opening night roster. You're battling for that pecking order of call-ups, um, you know, from, uh, from the American League as time goes on. You're, you're battling for the coach's attention to say, this guy's really improved from last year, um, you know, and, and, I, and I think he's close. You know, so you're always, you know, battling for some level of um, attention, I guess, so to speak, whether it's uh, for, for the immediate or for the future. Is, 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 is Harkins one of those guys? Well, Harks, uh, you know, Harks played, uh, you know, the parts of the last couple of seasons for us. And I, you know, we're looking for him to take that next step. Like he's a younger player that, um, you know, has grown, you know, his game uh, a lot came, came in to, you know, hockey, uh, pro hockey is more of a natural centerman has played mostly on the wing for us. Um, but, you know, we're, we're looking for him to, you know, to, to take a step. We lost uh, guys, um, you know, to, to different organizations like Nate Thompson and, and, uh, and Lewis, um, you know, who were mainstays uh, for us last year on the fourth line. So for, we're looking for, you know, some of those younger players to take the bull by the horns, so to speak, and, and, uh, and, and pick up where, you know, those guys may be left off. With Kevin Chevel Day off of the Winnipeg Jets, when you watch a preseason game, I assume you watch it differently than you would a regular season game. Are you, do you, do you know, do you have a tendency to watch young players or players that are trying to make the roster a little more closely? Yeah. Is that your I, focus? Yeah. You, you are interested, you know, maybe a little bit more in that. It's like some of the veteran players, they're looking to get the kinks out of the, their game. So, you know, you, you kind of know, you know, where they're at um, and uh, the, the expectations maybe are, are a little bit different, um, you know, there you're looking for, um, you know, to see how younger players handle, like, you know, case in point, uh, you know, the other night when uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois took the, the cross check to the face and, and had to go for stitches, uh, you know, all of a sudden we have a five minute power play. Well, you get Cole Perfetti out there now on the, on the number one unit. And he gets a chance to, uh, you know, to, to, to play those extra minutes, you know, because a guy like, uh, you know, Dubois goes down. So those are the opportunities that you're looking to, to give the younger players. And, and, and again, and Cole's a perfect example of a first round draft pick from two years ago that this is his first training camp. Never had the, uh, the experience uh, of the training camp uh, last year. And uh, fortunately, Fortunately, he was able to play for, for, you know, the Moose in the American League and excel there. But, um, you know, this is uh, an exciting moment for him as well. And We're, I would assume you expect Perfetti to play some games for the big club this year, right? You know, uh, again, that'll that'll be determined on, on a lot of different uh, situations. But, you know, certainly the door's, you know, wide open or the door's right there for him to kick down if you'd like. And, and um, we're excited. Uh, he, he's He's had a good, you know, camp so far. He's, he played in the first game. I think he's going to end up playing in the in the in the next uh, couple of games as well here. Um, so he'll get a, a real good opportunity to get a feel for what the National League, uh, you know, is about. Now that being said, this is still preseason, and and you know, it, it is uh, the game does change uh, dramatically, um, you know, when uh, when the lights come on, so to speak, for uh, for opening night. You are going into a season where once again, you'll be crossing the border on a regular basis and you'll be doing so more than any other team, I think in, in Canada, uh, given the, um, the division that you're in, uh, you have no other Canadian teams in your, uh, in your, in your division. Right. Does that present any concerns, problems, um, given that COVID is still with us? Well, there's, there's some logistical things that we're, you know, going to uh, obviously have to uh, take care of, you know, being, you know, making sure that the testing schedules for, you know, for the traveling party uh, are scheduled, you know, correctly and, and, uh, and that you get the results back in a, in a, in a time frame that allows you to not have to uh, delay travel or anything like that. So those are things that uh, you spend a lot of time with your team services, people behind the scenes to make sure that all those things are taken care of. And, um, you know, it was interesting. I, uh, you know, my kids are, are both, uh, you know, in school or working in the U S and I, I had a chance to go and visit them for the first time in, in, in over, I guess, 18 months. And I, so I, you know, I ended up going down seeing them and, and it was bizarre for me because that was the first time in, in, you know, in that period of time that, that I had been in the U S. So it was, uh, it was weird. It was a different feeling. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the guys, um, you know, do take, you know, to the road and, and, and what, you know, what their level of um, ease will be to, to, you know, to kind of maybe branch out and go to a restaurant or not. I, I don't know. You know, we, we spent the whole entire year last year, obviously, you know, in the hotels, in our own sort of bubble, so to speak, um, 
And, um, you know, there, there were some interesting things that came of it. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, you, you got a lot, to, you got to know the, you know, some of the people maybe a little bit better and stuff like that in some regards, but in some regards, you know, you, you still miss that ability to, um, you know, to bond as a team. So, um, it'll be interesting to see how it, uh, how it does play out, uh, with, uh, with the cross border travel. Uh are you suggesting that it might even change some routines and philosophy when you're on the road? You know, it'll, yeah, I think, you know, um, it'll be interesting to see. I think some different places you're going to go to, you're going to feel, um, you know, maybe a little more hesitancy than others. At least I guess I can only speak for myself is, is that, you know, th there's going to be a, a little bit of a, of, of a learning curve to see what uh, that new normal, um, you know, is going to be like. And um, th there were some routines, I think, that players – got into you know because of last year that that might be hard for them to shake because in some ways there was you know mm. uh, again a lot of uh, uh, a lot of different things that you had to um do and it became natural and now do, do, do you have to when you set up a player's lounge like that was part of the whole are you gonna have to do that again kevin so you know it's not part of the protocol but it, you, hey it might not be a bad idea you know like it might be something that uh, that does make sense whereas obviously you know we're, we're fully vaccinated so the the team can move around a little bit differently than they could even, you know, in that bubble scenario last year. But, um, you know, maybe that is not a bad idea, you know, to, 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 to provide something for the guys to, you know, not have to uh, uh, venture out. Uh, so you mentioned your team is fully vaccinated. Um, have you thought about what, would, what you would have done if one or two of the members of your team or more had not been vaccinated, how you would have dealt with that? Well, given, you know, given what you just mentioned before, that we're probably a team or the team that's going to cross the border the most, I think that we would be, we would have been impacted, uh, you know, sure. quite, heavily, quite heavily by that. So uh, fortunately, uh, you know, I didn't have to get into that, uh, into that scenario, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it is something that uh, could have been very real had, uh, you know, had, had the, the fortunes of our uh, team, you know, uh, if we didn't have a vaccinated player. Yeah. Did you have you know, to talk we, we, any uh, of your players into getting vaccinated or were they all no, voluntarily it, it, there? Yeah, it's a personal decision. So there, there really wasn't any talking, you know, into, I think, um, uh, you know, again, I think anybody that had some hesitancy had some hesitancy for, for valid reasons. Um, you know, whether it was, uh, you know, health or, or family or what, but, um, you know, fortunately, uh, again, our, our group did and, and, um, you know, fortunately for, I guess, our province is, is um, uh, we're, we're, our vaccination rates for our province, you know, are, are, are in general, you know, on the good side. Uh, we, we haven't uh, had a chance to reflect on how your season ended last year at all. Um, you know, it, it, have you been able to find a way to explain how you sweep the Edmonton Oilers in four and then lose to Montreal? You did? That's hockey, baby. You know, that's... <laughs> um, you don't, you don't get to predict, you don't get to prognosticate, doesn't matter what's on paper, you know, you've got to go out and play and, and there's certain elements that, that you can't control, um, you know, even as a player, like that's, that's the game. And, and that's why you should never, ever take any aspect of the game for granted because um, it's, uh, it's won and lost. And that's what, I guess that's what makes, you know, the Stanley cup playoffs such a, an, an intriguing um, aspect of, of hockey and, and sports in general. And that's why they, they say that, you know, a lot of people say, I shouldn't say everyone says, but to win the Stanley cup might be the hardest championship in pro sports to, uh, to, to, to win. Well, logic would suggest that you, um, you know, you, you climbed the mountain in beating Edmonton to some extent and did it so convincingly. And then Montreal comes in off a seven game series was there any sense in your mind that your club might have relaxed, been a little overconfident? Well, I don't know that it was so much, uh, you know, that I think that, uh, you know, there was an element of, uh, of rust. Um, I do know, you know, in the time frame that we were getting ready, you know, we got ready to play Toronto three times and, yeah. you know, and mentally, you know, you can, you, you, you had to condition yourself of, okay, you know, the series is going to start Wednesday. The series is going to start Friday. The series is going to start Monday, you know, so you had those kind of peaks and, 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 and uh, where you're getting ready to ramp up your emotions. And then obviously in the last one, um, or even maybe in the last two, you're starting to prepare for, for both, um, you know, Montreal and Toronto. 
Um, but the unfortunate side for us is we, we ended up ending the Edmonton series healthier than we did starting the uh, Montreal series with a, a player like, uh, um, you know, Paul Stastny, you know, having, a, a, you know, some back spasms that, you know, kind of, well, not kind of kept them out of, of action. So um, that was an unfortunate, uh, you know, thing that, again, just part of part of the game of hockey. The other interesting thing is that you have had a bit of a turnover this year, and you mentioned that your veteran guys like Lewis and Thompson aren't there. How do you replace that veteran leadership? Well, you know, I think we brought in some some fantastic veterans in Dylan and, and Schmidt. You know, so the the we brought in some guys that uh, you know are not only veteran, they're they're impact veterans uh, uh, higher up in the lineup. So. Um, and, and everybody's one year older and everyone's got one more year of experience, you know, Nikolai Ehlers, Kyle Connor, um, you know, Jansen Harkins, uh, Josh Morrissey, all those guys, they, they, they went through that, you know, that, the, the heartache of what we had to go through, you know, last year. And, and, um, you know, we, we had some, some great guys too on, on the taxi squad that, um, you know, again, never really got the opportunity that they probably, um, you know, uh, you know, should have, and and um, and then we got some younger players that are you know coming into their their own developmentally, like uh, David Gustafson, and so you know, again, as an organization, you you do need to inject um, some you know some fresh blood in there as well. Um, but uh, you know, I think we 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 addressed our experience that we lost, uh, and then some um, with uh, guys higher up in the lineup. When your team was um, what came back to Winnipeg, there was a lot of talk about the ability of the franchise to lure, for lack of a better word, free agents to to Winnipeg. And would the guys that were moving there be altogether happy? Is it fair to say that you have now erased that? And especially with the guys, the two guys that you signed this year? So I don't know that you'll ever, um, you know, erase, um, you know, that there's always going to be no trades as long as the no trades uh, are allowed in contracts, there's going to be teams that, you know, whether it's, you know, again, we do contracts as well here and give players that sign with us, no trades, and they put a list of teams together. I couldn't tell you why they do or what their motivations are. And, you know, and, and, and when you get their list back, you look at it and you wonder, okay, well, why doesn't he want to go to, you know, the New York area, or why doesn't he want to go to California or why? So, you know, again, every, every player that earns their right has that perspective to, you know, to, 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 to do. But um, one, one thing I think that, you know, what we've had to do or what we have done is, is worked hard to have a team that players want to play for because they, you know, ultimately what players want is a chance to win. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so as an organization, uh, you know, Mark, Mark Chipman, you know, as the managing, you know, partner of, of, uh, between, uh, you know, him and, and David Thompson, they've, the, 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 the mantra and the mandate that they said from the beginning is that, you know, we want this team to be a source of pride, um, for Winnipeg. And, you know, we want to treat the players, uh, you know, as well as, 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 uh, as any other team in the national hockey league and more. So we've been able to do that. And, and, um, you know, we've had opportunities where, you know, guys like Blake Wheeler could have left, you know, twice or three times, you know, when Dustin Bufflin had choices to, to go sign as a free agent somewhere else, he chose to stay. So, um, you know, if you've ever been to Winnipeg and, and, and experienced, you know, living here, it's not hard to sell Winnipeg as a community and, and, and what it is like to raise a family. Cause, uh, and that's why we've had success, I think too, with drafting players, and keeping them because once you get here you realize you know just what a great uh, great market it is and your fan base deserves some credit for making uh, your arena one of the greatest advantages in the national hockey league it is it's tough and, and you know like e even the guys you know when once they get here they you talk about that and they say geez it was always you know it was always so hard like the fans are right on top of you it's a unique building like it's a it's it's like a smaller footprint than than a lot of than every other building in the National Hockey League, but yet it still has a lot of the uh, you know the new amenities and and um, you know but but you do get that experience of the fans being right on top of you. Kevin Shevelday is with us, the general manager of the Winnipeg Jets. Take a quick break and come back with more after these messages. Bob McCown, John Shannon, with you, and Kevin Shevelday off the uh, GM of the Winnipeg Jets is with us. Um. Less, a little less about your team for a second and a little bit about uh, some things that are going on. Um, 
crackdown on cross-checking is a big issue this year. Um, and there seems to be, <laughs> there's always something, <laughs> I guess, that the game and the league are, are focused on. Did this need addressing in your opinion? Well, I do think there's some egregious uh, situations that, you know, that did happen that, you, you know, didn't get called. And, you know, sometimes that leads to, um, you know, a, a heightened awareness of it. And, and then sometimes it leads to discussions. And, and in some cases, you know, it, it leads to uh, heightened awareness. Now, obviously, the rule really hasn't been changed. It's just more of an emphasis, you know, that that's put on it um, from an interpretation standpoint. A lot of times, what will happen is the league will, you know, come to our general managers meetings with, you know, a handful of clips, you know, that of, of, of events that have happened um, in the games over the course of time. And they'll say, you know, yay or nay, penalty or not. And um, it's interesting. Sometimes those votes are, are very, you know, heavily weighted one way or another. Sometimes they're split down the middle. And, and um, when the votes start to get heavily weighed one way than the other, then they, they take a look at, you know, well, should we, you know, is the standard where it needs to be? And, and it got to the point, I think, where there was, um, you know, some areas of, of cross-checking that uh, that needed uh, needed to be addressed. Now, like anything, the pendulum is going to swing one way and, you know, could lead to something, you know, going the other way. Is And the, the law of unintended consequences is always something that we talk about in our GM meetings that, you know, be careful because, you you, you know, one action will affect another. So, um, we'll see how, uh, how, how it all plays out. Did you think I, it was problematic? Well, again, there, there, there are some areas that, you know, again, you, you want the skilled players to, to be able to, uh, you know, to play the stick sure. is, uh, you know, is to be used in a, in a certain manner. Um, and, um, you know, when it does start to get out of the way, I do think you need to, 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 to bring it back in. Now, that being said, I'm just glad I'm not playing because when they took the can opener out of the game, that was my <laughs> strike number one. And, and, and if I couldn't have cross-checked when I played, then, you know, the, my career would even have been shorter than it was. Uh, you beat me to it, Kevin. I mean, <laughs> this is the, 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 one, the one thing we got to watch is that you, you, there, at, a, at a certain point, you don't, at least this is my personal opinion, I don't think you want to take the physical nature out of the game, do you? No, well, physical nature, no. And I think, you know, you, you want... You know, you want to be able to, you know, and as a defenseman, you're sensitive to it. You still want to be able to clean the crease. You still want to be able to, you know, box out guys. And and I do think that, you know, you still, you know, will be able to push guys, um, you know, in that manner. It, it's just a matter of, you know, the ones that when, when you're reefing against a guy, you know, whether, um, you know, hitting a guy in the back when the defenseman's taking a slap shot, you know, like, that could lead to something pretty, pretty serious. If, you know, if a forward loses his balance and, and can't protect himself or watch a puck come and hit him. So those are things that, you know, I, I think you, you have to still, um, you know, be very cautious of and, 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 and as, as a league, we need to be cognizant of. Is there anything else that you think needs addressing? I mean, uh, hooking has been addressed. Holding has been addressed. Interference has been addressed. Now cross-checking has been addressed. Certainly hits to the head have been addressed. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a cycle, isn't it? Of, of you go through several seasons and you see what guys are doing. And if they don't do one thing, they're going to lean to something else. Is there anything else? Well, so that's what I guess I was getting to with the law of unintended consequences. You don't know what this might lead to because you right. know, guys are going to find a way of, of something or another. But um, one thing, you know, again, I think the, the game is in a great spot, though. Like, I, I don't I'm not lo looking to over police it, um, but I do think it's, you know, it's in a great spot. It's as fast as it's ever been. Um, you know, it's 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 exciting, I think, from a perspective of, of a person that can can actually sit in the stands now and watch because again to me that's that's the the essence of the game is 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 beautiful when you get it to sit in the stands and and and, and watch it all unfold in front of you so um can't sit here and say there's one particular thing that i that i would you know again put on the agenda for the next gm meetings but we're only getting started hey how much uh, you know the the fact that you were moving from the canadian division you're going central so you're going from east west to north south uh, which makes your travel, it might make it a little easier time zone wise, but it's probably still the same amount of distance. Um, did When you and Mark and, and everybody else in the office sat down and talked in the summer, was there any thought that you, you kind of enjoyed the Canadian system more than the central? 
Well, I, I do know that, uh, you know, Mark was, was very open about it. Um, you know, he, he really enjoyed having the, you know, the, 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 the Eastern Canadian teams coming into the building, like uh, obviously the, the original sixes and stuff like that from Canada and, you know, those battles that, uh, that we had with the Oilers, you know, back in, uh, in Jets 1.0, I think fans, you know, really, really, you know, appreciated those kind of, uh, you know, things back in the Smythe division battles. But, you know, at the end of the day, it worked okay because we we played those maybe two or three game sets in a city and then you could go and you know reestablish yourself in the time zone but um but crisscrossing back and forth through the time zones is hard on a player it really is and, mm -hmm. and um you know we, we do though have a couple of trips this year where we you know we start on the um you know start on the west coast and come back home and play a game and then go to the east coast and so you, you have those scheduling anomalies um, where, you know, last year, it, you know, in, in some ways people have asked, they said, well, you know, would you want to go back to those two games or three game sets in the city to get it out of the way? And, and in some ways you would, but I don't know, you know, we were able to do that last year because there was nothing else scheduled in all these buildings. And, and hopefully, you know, all these buildings do get back to the concerts and stuff like that, that, um, you know, the entertainment world is looking for. Is that a classic case or you prefer that? you know on the road and you wouldn't want it at home well i think from a probably from a ticket selling standpoint you know the ticket people would tell you they like to have the variety of, of people in from a hockey standpoint i think the players would say they like the you know the the ability to to, to not have to pick up after a game and, and and go and 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 play in another city so um but again it, it's uh and then you know there's a handful of guys that i've talked to so they, they're just they're really excited about playing all the teams again because mm -hmm. that's that's what they like. They like to measure themselves against everybody, you know, or, you know, and, and go to different cities and, 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 and experience, you know, the different arenas. Well, I, I think Shannon will attest to this when, when last season ended, um, I made the personal point of saying that I kind of liked it. I liked a lot of the elements of the Canadian division. I liked the fact that you didn't always have to travel right after the game. I liked the two game series where a team comes in and you play them twice. I like that concept. It's almost like playoff hockey, even in, um, in, in January or November. There are a lot of factors about this that I, I really liked. And yet almost none of the hockey pucks that follow this game and are involved in this game, they all hated it. They all told me I was crazy, but I don't know. There were some things in there that I, I kind of liked as a GM were there things in there that I guess you've already said there, there were parts of this that you thought were okay. Yeah, there was, there's no question about it. And, and we, we, as general managers actually had some conversation about this um, prior to COVID actually as a, as a, as a, as a way to, to, to lessen the fatigue on the bodies of the players and stuff like that. And, but, but invariably what did start coming up when we started to go down, you know, those conversations was, was building availability and stuff like that and being able yeah, I get it. to schedule. But you know what the interesting thing for me that was really, it was different last year. Um, it, it felt like you were in your own league though. So like oh, you, wow. you really had to have to uh, pay attention to the other leagues to, 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 you know, you fell out of touch with the other teams, you know, like, Oh, uh, I get it. You, you really, you know, focused in on, okay, what's going on in Vancouver tonight and all you know, as opposed to, you know, Hey, you know, what's going on with, uh, you know, Nashville or Dallas, or, you know, like it, it, it didn't matter as much in your own mind because you were so hyper-focused on your Canadian division. Versus Although the difference of course would be if you had a Canadian division this year, you would still play games outside your division, oh, uh, which you didn't, yeah. you didn't do last year. Yeah. So you'd have, I don't know how many games against um, the other teams and, and you'd still do traveling. You'd still do it across the border. So that would have been kind of the balance act, I think of, um, of what you missed but, last year. But the hardest part for the jets, the hardest part for the jets and Kevin, you correct me if I'm wrong, is that when you talk about your rivals, when you talk about the teams that fans in your, in Winnipeg love to hate, yeah. none of them are in your division. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, no. It's, uh... So how do you manage that? I mean, it, we'd, I'd love to see the. I'd love to. And you did a. You had a playoff series against them. I'd love to see the Minnesota Winnipeg rivalry grow. Right. But you know, your biggest rivals are Edmonton, Toronto, Montreal, and so how do you? That becomes a real fresh. I mean, if I'm a Jets fan, I'm saying I I want to see I those, more of those three teams more. 
Yeah. Well, and, and that's and that goes back to you know what I said. I think Mark Chipman was pretty you know pretty vocal about that that he liked that. But the the flip side of it is is uh, you know it goes back to John's you know question there about about travel and and you know the interesting thing is when we sit down with the schedule maker, one of their biggest challenges is our location. Like we are dead smack in the middle. Yeah. There's no one else you know that is a geographical twin is what you know, the the words that they use in in uh when, in the scheduling side of it you know you've got you know edmonton calgary well invariably someone's always coming in and playing edmonton and calgary and someone you know is probably going to get you know wh whether it's edmonton or calgary you're going to get that team tired um you know after playing the night before in, in one of the other cities you got that same phenomenon in florida you got the same phenomenon in in uh in in la and 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 california is there where you know they, they you go there you play two games well you come to winnipeg you, you know the team's got to fly from somewhere uh and then go somewhere else whether it's changing a time zone uh crossing a border like minnesota is our closest rival from the from that standpoint but you got to cross the border which you know is difficult for some teams at the best of times now we're gonna have to learn what that means you know in COVID. but um so but think about it so so a team comes up from um, the U.S. comes to play us in Canada. They need a COVID test, you know, to to uh, by a certain period of time before they can come in. Now, where's their next game going to be? Is it back in the U.S.? Do they need to take another test? Have they have they tested out already? You know, to, to go back into the U.S. Uh, from that. So those are all the logistical things that um, you know that uh, uh, our, our staffs are going to have to uh, uh, make sure of. Well, and I'm gathering that they they have enough information now that there's been enough international uh, air traffic to get a sense that it takes longer. At least it takes longer for Joe Normal, um, and I would assume it will take longer for you as a team and even even doing the prep because there's more security, more things to go through, and that's going to add to your travel time, which is going to make your guys um, a little ornery, more ornery by the time mid season comes along, forget about the end of the year, huh? Well, it'll be an interesting in a season where, um, you know, we will have an Olympic break and you've got, uh, uh you've got that. So there, there's a, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of new things that uh, we haven't had for a couple of years. Hey, I, just to ask you about a couple guys. Um, you, you mentioned that Dubois got clipped the other night with a, on the chin, but he'll be okay. Um, what's your expectation for him this year? You know, uh, again, I, I think it, uh, it, it his movement last year from from uh, Columbus to here, going through the uh, the quarantine and then coming and playing a game and then getting injured and essentially being out for for another couple of weeks after that, uh, and then you know coming to a team and and not really ever you know being a part of anything. You know, there was no you know it wasn't team dinners, there wasn't socializing, there wasn't you know trying to acclimate yourself. Like you, you know, there was no uh, you know, going to each other's rooms, playing cards, you know, those kind of things that, you know, guys did, um, you know, you couldn't do that last year. So it was a tough year on and off the ice, I think for, for a lot of players, you know, that, uh, that did move. And, um, you know, for a young player like him going through that for the first time, getting injured really for the first time, um, you know, it was a tough year, but, but he's, he's coming to camp here. He's in, you know, in great shape. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he obviously we've only had the one game there, but he looked good in it. And, um, I, you know, I, I'm expecting a uh, real good things from him. Somebody else you wanted to mention, Shannon, you mentioned, a well, couple, just, a just, uh, you, just, just the two defensemen. You, it's funny. You, you, you've acquired two guys in Dylan and Schmidt. Dylan played really well when he was in San Jose against the jets in a playoff series and Schmidt played great in Vegas when he yeah. played against you. Uh, how, how much of that, those kind of things were factors when you, when you said we can improve our blue line with those guys. Well, it's all about opportunity too, you know, like uh, we, we were hoping that uh, Brendan Dillon would get the free agency a couple of years ago. And, and uh, you know, after, you know, when his contract was ending with Washington and hoping we'd get a chance at, at taking a swing at him, but obviously, you know, he had, uh, he had signed and, um, you know, we, we sat down as things started to unfold for the, uh, for the expansion draft and, and, and everything like that. And looked at, uh, looked at everyone's situation and, and wondered what they were going to do. Washington, obviously we looked at their cap and saw that there may be a chance. And then when we saw that, uh, you know, he was left exposed in the, uh, in the expansion draft, you know, we, we kind of, we got on the, got on the horn right away and tried to see if there was a, a way of, of maybe acquiring him, you know, if it was through Seattle or, 
uh, if they, if, if Washington maybe wanted to move them, you know, and they really didn't, but, um, you know, again, I think their, their salary cap, you know, forced, uh, forced their hand. So we were excited, you know, to acquire him. And all through that time, you know, we started talking to, uh, you know, Vancouver about, you know, Nate Schmidt and knowing that again, the, the, the crunch that they were going to have to face as well. So it was, uh, it, it, it was an interesting timing thing is, and, and, uh, we were very fortunate that, um, you know, we could find a way to get the cap space, because if you think about it at that time, we still didn't have Pionk signed and we still didn't have cop signed. So right. you, you've got placeholders in there. You've got projections. You, 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 you want to try to do some things to make sure you can shore your team up. And, um, you know, Larry Simmons, who, who handles, you know, the cap for us and contracts, uh, just did an outstanding job of, of, uh, of shoehorning, you know, all those kind of things in and, um, you know, for our team, and it was kind of, I think it's what we, what we needed, you know, we lost Dustin Bufflin a couple of years ago. Um, you know, here's a guy that, uh, you know, six, four, two sixty can go into a scrum and, you know, and, and, uh, and pull two guys out, but yet in the dressing room, he's, uh, you know, kind of the class clown type thing and, 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 you know, got guys loose. Well, you know, we've got in Dylan, we've got that physical guy, I think that can, can really, you know, give us that element. And then Nate Schmidt, like he's just, a, his energy is just infectious and, and he's only been here for, you know, a little bit, but you know, like he's, uh, it, it, there's just always a smile on his face and, and a laugh and, and uh, he's just an awesome guy to be around. So, um, you know, we're excited. I, I think they'll both fit in chemistry wise and, um, you know, play wise, hopefully they're, they're what we needed. And how difficult was it to, I mean, the guy, you've always been really strong at, at, the, at drafting and developing how difficult was to let Sammy Niku go? Well, you know, again, Sammy, there, there's been a lot of, um, you know, different uh, situations and circumstances that, that, that have, you know, worked in his favor and, and sometimes against them as well. So, um, you know, it, it's tough. You can't, uh, you know, sometimes players have to earn their way, you know, into, you know, those right situations and, and uh, you, you know, at the national league level, it's about winning. And, and when you get an opportunity to get, you know, two young defensemen or two, you do defensemen, like, uh, you know, like the veteran guys that we got, right. you know, it's all about, you know, trying to win. And this, this group here, I think appreciates that. And we've got some good young defensemen coming here and Billy Hainola and, and uh, Dylan Sandberg and, you know, we, we've actually had some, you know, really good guys in, in camp here that, uh, um, you know, are, are getting some, you know, some exhibition games, uh, uh, you know, right now, Johnny Kovacevic is a player that played for the Moose uh, for the last two years, he looked really good in game one of the preseason game here is going to get another one coming up. So um, th those are the things that organizations just, just keep on evolving. Uh, we're always appreciative, as you know, of, uh, of, uh, the opportunity that we have to, uh, to chat with you. We, uh, we appreciate the time that you, you commit to us on occasion. And, uh, especially today where it's 28 degrees and summer like at the end of September in Winnipeg. Now I know you wouldn't have been on the golf course anyway. You got work to do. It's hockey season now, yeah. but nonetheless, yeah. You're inside chatting with us, and we're most appreciative. Yeah, but we would have been on the golf course, Bob. Yeah, yeah we would have been. I wouldn't have been on the game of, uh, on the golf course because, you know, the, the game of golf wouldn't allow me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we all have days like that, I can assure you, whether you play or not. Uh, Kevin, good to see you. We wish you the best of luck this year. And, um, I'm, I'm, you know, as close to a normal season, we hope, as, uh, as can be expected. Good luck to you, and thanks again for your time. Well, thanks for having me on, guys. Really appreciate it. Kevin Shovel Day Off. We'll come back with more after this. Bob McCowan and John Shannon on the podcast and on uh, Sirius XM 167. Thanks to Kevin Shovel Day Off for joining us uh, once again. Uh, Evander Kane has had a most interesting last few months. Um, he was accused of betting on hockey games. I don't know if he was accused actually of betting against his own team. No, I, he was own. accused accused by his ex-wife of betting on hockey games. And the National Hockey League, I guess, has exonerated him of that allegation. Which what I I suppose it's true, but I mean, you you have to understand. I'm a little pessimistic. Um, hopefully, you can understand. I don't know whether they would want to do that. And yet, on the other hand, now well, I mean, hold on. Why would you be pessimistic? Well. I think historically leagues, um, I mean, do you want to get into a Pete Rose situation? Now, no. Pete Rose bet on baseball games, but Pete Rose always said 
He never bet against the Cincinnati Reds. Right. Um, did he bet on the Cincinnati Reds? Probably. Did he bet against the Cincinnati Reds? He always said no. And yet the league never um, acknowledged that. They continue to imply that he may have. Mm. And I just think that leagues today are so self-aware and so self-protective. You know, it's no different than the, the National Football League cover up hundreds of positive steroid tests. Yeah, that story's been think, out there for a de- more than a decade. I mean, the attitude towards gambling, and I'm not suggesting that players should be allowed to gamble at, at all. I, well, they shouldn't be. But the, the fact now that gambling houses uh, and, and, and betting websites are now business partners, does that change anything? Well, it wouldn't have changed anything for me because I don't think there's a correlation between gambling and performance Uh, on the, under the provide the, and I've said this all along with regard to Pete Rose and it's generically true in my mind. If you bet against your own team, then you open up. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. wrong. And that opens up the possibility of something untoward going on. Mm -hmm. If you bet on your own team, like I'd almost rather you bet on your own team than bet on a game that's even not even in your league because your motivation is going to be as high as it can possibly be. Every player has essentially has money on every game they play because they get paid based upon their performance in that game. Mm. Um, you know, I, if, if I bet on the ratings on this show, Oof. you'd win every time. Well, thank you very much. I would, but, but would somebody say that's untoward, unprofessional? I should be kicked off because I did that. I think quite the opposite, you know, I mean, I know it's a terrible example, but, you know, um, I really don't, I I care only if you bet against your team. Anyway, Kane was exonerated from that, but now he was, he's in shit for, um, COVID protocol. I mean, the guy is a, is, is, is a walking nightmare. Do they want to get, get him out of the game? Do they want to get rid of him? Is that what they're looking to do? Well, and he's already, uh, there are levels of, of financial stress that he's under as well. Well, he's bankrupt, um, isn't he? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the question I think for, for, for Doug Wilson in San Jose is what role do you see Kane on your team at any point? Now, the players have come out and said, listen, if he's in the dressing room, he's one of us and we're going to play. But that it's it's really put a pall in, in many ways on what's going on in San Jose. You know, Evander, Evander, you know, there's there's two two thought processes. Evander, one process thought is that he can't get out of his own way. I mean, he screws up every time and he he doubles down on it. The other one is that perhaps they're picking on him, Bob. Perhaps because he's uh, he's had mistakes before. People are, are overzealous on what is right or wrong for Evander Kane. And I, you know, I, I'm not close enough to it to know which way or the other it is. Well, I, I, okay, I'll buy that in a generic sense. But here is the truth. Evander Kane, I believe, is smarter than a post. And if you are, then you know what, that you make your living playing a game. And within that game, there are rules and regulations. Sure. We all live in that environment. And I mean, not just generic rules and regulations. I mean, can Evander Kane go to Vegas as a normal citizen and put down a boatload of money? Absolutely. On, on a he day? should sure be he able can. to. Sure, sure he can. can. But as a high profile hockey player, that's not a good look. And you should know, he should know that. And I'm a lot not of sure the things, he's cared about that though. Well, I'm I don't think sure he does cares. care about it, but he should care yeah. about it if he cares about his future. Because it's, you know, again, things have gotten a lot grayer in the last nine months or so since the leagues got into bed with all this gambling stuff. And, oh, yeah. and their position on all this has, has changed and is changing out of necessity because these are now their partners. And they need more transparency. You need transparency. You, you know, we're going we're gonna to have to make sure that the betting is fair and square, whether it's a, a prop bet or, or game bet. I'll tell you, John, I, you know, I lived in Vegas for a, a number of years. I used, mm-hmm. they used to have these giant football helmet chairs at Caesars palace <laughs> and guys used to pay money to sit in those chairs on Sunday morning when the game started Well, Sunday afternoon, Sunday morning in Vegas sure, time. Sure. Yeah. And the NFL made them take them out. The NFL 
made them take the nicknames of the teams off the board. Yeah. So it was no longer the Giants versus the Chargers. It was NYN for mm -hmm. National Conference against San Diego, now LA. Yeah. They couldn't even put the nicknames up on the board. And they right. did it all because the league wasn't getting what they thought was a share yeah. of, sure. the, of the revenue from gambling. Now they're in bed with all those casinos. Now you can put up whatever you want. Well, and, and in fact, in fact, the Washington Capitals, Bob, the league uh, starting next season, everybody will have a three inch patch on their on their sweaters. The Washington Capitals will have a gambling site on their sweaters next year. Don't be surprised if somewhere down the road, they don't have another patch somewhere that says bet on me. <laughs> Actually, yes. that's a good name. You know, that's a good name for our website. We should, maybe we should start a gambling website bet on me. Oh yeah. That's what we need to do. Yeah. Somebody will suspend us. Oh no, wait, we don't work no, for not anybody. anymore. Not anymore. They can't do anything. We'll do whatever the <laughs> hell we want then. won't we? <laughs> Absolutely. Haven't we always? Well, within some reason. Yes. <laughs> which um, is why we're not working for anybody anymore <laughs> well i don't mind it to tell you the honest to god's truth yeah, good point um when you work for yourself you know that you're not working for somebody that's dumber than you yeah well maybe <laughs> as dumb but not dumber when you're working for yourself just don't have a fight with the boss that's all <laughs> well, that happens every day for god's sakes all right uh we're going to bring them another show tomorrow yeah, we will. Let's right. do another one tomorrow. Right. We'll see. We'll, we'll what the see. heck? Like my old football coach used to say, just keep running this play till you get it right. Uh, for John Shannon, Bob McCowan, we'll see you next time. Goodbye, everybody.